Welcome to In The Loop. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of In The Loop. So we've said it before and we'll say it again. Your website is the most crucial tool when it comes to winning in the digital environment. So how does it stack up? In this episode, Mike Burpo, that's myself, lead UI UX designer at Punchmark, and Cody Giles, director of integrated strategy at The Smithy Group, are talking best practices when it comes to your website and what you need to focus on to drive conversions. This episode is brought to you by Punchmark, the jewelry industry's leading website provider, joining the community of nearly 500 other jewelry stores and choosing Punchmark's easy to run and e-commerce enabled website platform by visiting punchmark.com for your free trial demo. And this episode is brought to you by The Smithy Group, a digital growth agency that helps leaders and businesses dream bigger and achieve multi-generational integrity. Through insights and intelligence, digital marketing, and advertising solutions, they help businesses expand their business and grow their revenue. The Smithy Group has helped hundreds of businesses surpass their goals and believe that whatever your business, whatever your story, they'll make it matter to your audience. Having a native integration with Punchmark, ClearSale prevents fraudulent chargebacks without interfering with the online shopping experience, therefore helping merchants to protect their revenue and improve their bottom line. ClearSale reviews incoming orders and provides straightforward decisions, accept or reject each order with no minimum sale requirement. Trusted by over 3,000 customers worldwide and touting a 99% retention rate, ClearSale has three major goals. Number one, prevent payment fraud and chargebacks. Number two, increase revenues by converting incorrectly declined transactions into approved transactions. And number three, compensate for losses related to fraudulent chargebacks. As a result, clients can sell more safely, even in dynamic or challenging international markets. More information at offer.clear.sale slash loop. That's L-O-U-P-E. Join other Punchmark clients to protect your revenues from fraud and false declines today. Thanks. Back to the show. So we're back. Maybe, Cody, we can set up this whole talk by going into what is kind of the overall role of your website? How do you see it? I think for us at TSG, we always say that your website is essentially your home base. So it's the one place you can lead everyone back to that's not your store. So, you know, the past several episodes, we've talked about social, we've talked about ads a little bit. All of that really involves going back to some major source. And for us, that major source is your home, which is your website. Yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, the nexus or the um, the crossroads for a lot of things. Whereas like if you, we've been talking a lot about social posting in the past couple of episodes, but traditionally, pretty much always, you're going to be driving, you know, the link in bio is going to be going to your website. If you're going to be having marketing or anything like that, you're going to be driving them back to your website. A lot of times even sales in your store start from your website as well. Like, hey, right. check out this piece of jewelry and you're going to add it to your wish list. And even if they don't buy online, they're going to bring it into the store. Yeah. It's like the brain to the entire body. Everything kind of flows back into your website. That's right. And I think that we can't even, again, overstate how important it is, especially right now with this uh, crazy impact that the coronavirus has had on e-commerce and the jewelry industry at large. We've seen a huge influx of sales to not just to clients that have traditionally done well with online sales, but to new clients that have started to see uh, a lot of their sales shift online. It's been pretty exciting. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of people maybe started their website they got that going and really saw it just as a source of information and you kind of just leave it. Like, okay, I have the website, the information's there. Let me focus on other things. But really it's important that you're always thinking about the website. And we saw that so much with COVID and things that were happening that all these websites that weren't ready for e-com suddenly wanted to make the impact and make that switch quick. So we started to see a significant progression in design and experience and all of this kind of really get throttled because of COVID. So now I think a lot of more websites are more up to date than they have been in the past five years. Which is exciting because as is one of those things, I always say it's a constant work in progress. Even when you launch, it's never going to be 100% done because you're still going to need to update it. You still need to go and add new images or create new landing pages or create new offers or promos or whatever it is, buy new ads. I feel like some people, they kind of, they want it to be like a crock pot, you know, set it and forget it sort of thing. And I don't know if that's the case. No, you definitely have to keep it updated. And it's just, again, it's another sales tool, essentially. You have your staff, you have your team there. We say that, you know, social can be used for sales, but your website, again, is the same thing and really allows you to house everything in a more concise manner than trying to upload everything on Facebook and getting disorganized and X, Y, and Z. It's really, the website allows you to take all this information, organize it into a seamless manner to make sure that 
you're paying for customers whenever they need you. That's right. So again, we've talked about, we, we're going to title this episode, um, how to drive online sales, but we changed it to drive online conversions. So can you maybe touch upon the difference between uh, sales versus conversions and kind of how they meet and not? Yeah, I think when we think about conversions, we can just think about goals. So what are the goals for the website? And if you're e-com, the ultimate goal is to sell a product. But yeah. whenever we think about, you know, websites that weren't ready for e-com, they still had goals. So we saw conversion goals. So that was a step back and it was making a wish list. So we saw products there. They could still make a wish list. We want someone to come to the website to find information we want them to come and then submit a form for more information. So other conversions, you know, booking an appointment and requesting information. So those were kind of always the main goals before e-com really came into play. And then all of a sudden with e-com and selling online, that's always seemed to be the number one conversion. But it's understanding there's so much more you can do there. And there's more of an impact when you can focus on every conversion goal, not just sales. There's so much more you can do with your website. So can you give me like a, not an exhaustive list, but just some goals that aren't just the traditional, you know, increase the size of sales or increase the number of sales. What are some other uh, conversion goals that they could have? Yeah, absolutely. So we can look at just wish list creation. I want people to come to the site and start adding things to their wish list so I can use that for clientele and reach out to them or their significant other and convert a sell that way. We have product inquiries. So I want them to view a product and click inquire more and give me their information so I can reach out to them other forms to submit. So even general inquiries about repair services, if we're talking about the jewelry industry, appointments made, that all leads to an appointment, obviously. Then we have others like chats. So if I have a chat feature enabled, I can set up conversions. And I, you know, I want to get four chats a day because I know I can convert one of them each day if I have that. And then also call tracking. So I want them to go to my website, my phone number's there, and they can click it and call me directly from that. So again, it's several more just besides simply a sale. Yeah. And, and it's, it gets a little bit tough because I feel like when people, I mean, I work in websites, so people constantly are like, oh, I don't know if this website is like worth it, or I don't know if my website's doing as well as I want it to, because we've only sold, you know, five things this year. But I always say it's like, yeah, but like, how many people have gone online, added to their wish list, met with their wife, and then uh, gone to the store and picked it up? Or, you know, started with a call, asked about your, you know, if you still are running this offer and then gone into the store and made the purchase. Those things, they can't be directly attributed to the website. But the more you look at it and start to see where like the numbers actually lie, you start to see how it, how it does. Yeah, I think it's important from a luxury standpoint as well. What are the chances of someone going to your site, seeing a stock product photo for a ring, for example, that's $10,000 seeing a little bit of information about the product and that's enough for them to add to cart and to buy. It's not likely to happen. We have to have several touch points. Even if you think about, I mean, probably how many times you go into a store to look at a product before you buy, because it is such a higher value. Yeah. It takes a few interactions for that to happen. So when we start measuring the impact of the site from other conversion standpoints, so I know they came, they viewed the product, they added it to their wish list. We see this iterative process lining up that leads to a sale. It's not just one jump. It's several footsteps that get you to the end goal. Yeah. And all those things, uh, you know, the conversions, it's just kind of like um, warming up the, the leads for you. So warming them up, meaning instead of having like just a cold call, you know, like, hey, would you like to buy a website? It's the process of slowly kind of leading them in. So you know that they're interested in this necklace because they added it to their wish list and they made an account. So maybe when that necklace goes on sales or when it starts to get closer to holiday season and it's likely that they need to be buying a gift, maybe you hit them up and say, you know, hey, this necklace is available. I know you're interested in it. It's 10% off. Why don't you stop in, see if you like it? And that's the kind of stuff that allows you to start making these advanced sales. Yeah, absolutely. I think too, we talked about warming up the lead. That's when it, we'd start talking about, you know, the about us page, which I think we'll talk about in a little bit later in the episode. Yeah. But what are these other elements that help us really use the website as a way to convey a message of who the brand is? I mean, we know for a lot of these products, if someone's looking for a diamond bracelet, they can go to several large e-com giants to make that purchase, but they're looking for someone locally. So using the website and telling the story and conveying the message of why being a small business matters, how long you've been in the community, really selling them on the brand overall is going to get them to buy into the product and really have them more excited to buy from you versus going on Amazon to get it or going to some big box retailer. That's where the website plays an important part of that, of warming them up and 
even we say this a lot nowadays, if someone's coming into your store for the first time, they know more about you already than you know about them because they've yeah. been to your website, they've been to your social. If you have your staff there, they could probably call out no different members of the team based on what they've saw on social. So they're already acquainted with you and they know about your brand already. So you don't have to really right. sell them as much on that, which is interesting. And again, so your website, again, like we said, the nexus for all of these, uh, these points of contact and that's why it's so important that every part of your, your, your web presence has been at least considered. Don't take anything for granted. So things like uh, your product shots, you, like you said, the same example, you know, if they wanted to buy a bracelet, they could go a number of different places. And if they're going to buy it online, it's going to be the same ease of purchase to get it from some major store as opposed to yours. But they want to go to you because you're local. And they want to support you. So that's why it's so important that that diamond bracelet looks as best as it can and the write-up describes exactly what that piece is as opposed to just taking a photo through your display window or um, you know, taking a photo that isn't that great quality or it's grainy or something like that. You know, it, it, seems, it seems cliche, but it, that's what helps you sell and knowing a little bit more about it. Content matters. Yeah, that's right. So maybe we can talk about the different parts of the website that are going to lead to these conversions. And I hate to use the term anatomy, but we'll just kind of break down the, the pieces of the website from, from head to, to tail. And maybe we can start with that, just the, the header and what they should be looking at. Yeah, sure. So when you look at that, I mean, when you go to the website, when your website first, the header is always there. It's typically with your logo, just below that you have your navigation. That's kind of all included there. Well, that is really the body of your website. And then you have your footer at the very end. Important to know that your header and your footer, they're always staying the same throughout no matter what page someone's viewing on your site. But that body really is what changes depending on where they're at. So when we go in deeper, you know, you have the home page. That's the very first page someone can come to on your website. That's really the home base of the website where you want to really elaborate on all of your services and what's most important to you. Then as they dive deeper, you have things like category pages where you can show off the variety of necklaces or rings, X, Y, and Z. They click into that, that's a step deeper into the site. At that point, we're at a product page. So we kind of have the hierarchy of homepage, category page, and then product pages. And then subsequent to that, kind of on the side are all landing pages, which is describe your services, your about us. If you want to talk about your bridal experience, X, Y, and Z, some of those pages that don't always involve product listings, but are just really important to convey your messages and what you're going for. Yeah. And in those, what we might even call um, global elements with the header and the navigation and the footer, those things, they're so important because they are the like steering wheel for the entire website. So that's why I think that making sure that those are really excellent. So things like um, having a real, having a search in your header, so that way you can search if you're looking for something and they don't immediately see diamond bracelet, they can search diamond bracelet and it's going to serve them up something relatively close. And then they can get a little bit uh, around there. But things like different pieces of messaging, like the global alert, which is a little strip of information that sits at the very top of your website, you'll see if you start looking around at other uh, very prominent e-commerce websites, you'll see that that global alert is utilized as a way to call out one very important piece of information, whether it's a sale, it's a store closure, it's a, um, a discount code, something along those lines, you'll see that they're always utilizing it for something clever. And I think that you shouldn't overlook it. Yeah. I think it's important to have a clear navigation as well. I always kind yeah. of panic sometimes when I'm on a website and I've gotten a few pages deep and the site set up to hide the navigation after you go into the side, you get a little bit deeper. At that point, I kind of panic like, okay, this isn't where I want to be, but I don't know how to get out. At that point, I'm just going to leave the website. So I'm just gone yeah. at that point. So that simple navigation, really making it clear of what a user can expect when they click on a page is very important. And that's really tricky too. And we think of, you know, the being in the jewelry industry terms that we would use versus how a consumer would refer to it. So it's important that we even think through terminology of yeah. how we, the, the terms we use versus what a consumer uses and making sure we use those terms as we build the site and think through navigation to think through how is a customer going to use the website yeah, compared that's to a great how. Point. Yeah. So a lot of the times I feel like people uh, in the jewelry industry, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think a lot of times jewelry industry people use the term bridal. And mm -hmm. I think that if you went out and talked to 
potential customers, you'll learn that a lot of people refer to it as engagement, engagement rings, not bridal rings. Oh, you, and maybe it's an area thing, but at least that's what I've seen in the two places I've lived so far. But that's why I think it's important to have a very clear navigation because then, or landing pages, because then these people can shop using their eyes as opposed to having to think. So again, it's kind of like, have you ever gone to like a, ah, man, like a really kind of mom and pop um, food, like restaurant, and they have so many options on the menu. It's just insane. They have 50 different pieces of food. Well, then you're kind of like overwhelmed. Well, if they just tailored it to only 10, well, suddenly you can make an easier decision. And you'll see that that's a really common tactic in a lot of e-commerce stores. If you go in and you split them between men's, women's, well, you go down, you find, you go into men's. Well, do you want a, a watch, a ring, or a necklace? And they split you into there and then they serve you up seven items as opposed to 50. And suddenly right. you can find it a little bit easier. Yeah. Navigation is so important there. Really thinking that through. Well, I think what you're saying about bridal engagement is spot on. We've seen that same trend and how we think about even from when we're launching Google campaigns and using copy of, do we want to say bridal? Do we want to say engagement? We really have to be critical and think that, think that through a little bit more in depth just to make sure we're appealing to the consumer. I think something you mentioned too is that we still have a lot of retailers from a header perspective wanting to place all of their store information. Everything, so the phone yeah. Number, address, everything. But really, that's the great opportunity you have with the footer is to kind of push that information to the bottom just from a visual standpoint alone of how it can just easily get so crammed in the very top. If you're, I don't know who it was, someone in this industry told a whole bunch of jewelers that they need to have their store hours and address in their header. And I want you to know that is not 100% true anymore. It might have been way back then, but everybody knows that your hours and uh, hours of operation and your address are going to be in your footer. No matter what, if you're a jewelry store or if you're a you know, a hair salon, it's going to be in the footer. Don't throw it in your header. Keep that thing clean and only to things that are wayfinding, you know, categories or, you know, hit them with contact or something like that. Um, you don't need to throw them with the address or anything like that. We'll use this as a quick reminder for anyone that if you've updated your hours because of COVID, make sure that you've done that on your website as well. You're updating your hours before we go into holidays. Very important call out. Great, great little PSA right there. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely. So one last thing before we get into this, this, uh, this break, um, what about with the homepage? There's a lot of talk about if you should throw all of your jewelry categories on there, if you should be throwing, if you should dedicate it only and keep it short to like services or only just to have them click in one more. What's your strategy on that? Yeah. It's interesting. Whenever we, like we onboard a new client, for example, we do a review of their website. We get a feel for their homepage, all their pages overall. But when we talk to them and say, okay, what are your overall goals? What are you looking to accomplish? And it's grow bridal sales, grow repair, X, Y, and Z. They tell us that, but when we look on the website, it doesn't match back on the homepage, which is really, that's the first page people come to more often than not. They're going to click through on something. If they're going to click through, it's going to happen there. So it's really important that when you think about your top three to five business goals, what are they? Now let's make sure we have room for that in the homepage. So we kind of, and that can be rotating and it should be. We should always be updating our homepages every one to two months with new information that's happening, events, X, Y, and Z. But what are those staples? So is it bridal? Is it repair? X, Y, and Z. How do we dedicate space to that on the homepage, including clear calls to action? So we give them just a glimpse about bridal, but then we always direct them back to a page deeper. So to a category page or to a landing page and provide that information. So I think it's always has to be rotating and then you always include certain things. So if you want to have your social feed pulling over, so they get a glimpse of what you're doing on social, customer testimonials, things like that, they kind of live more at the bottom third of the page. Yeah. They can kind of always stay there, but the top two thirds of the page, how are you always changing this out? with what's happening in your store, what your goals are as they're changing. It's really important. I agree. I mean, it's a balance between, you can look at all the best sites out there and you'll see that some opt for very short. I want to say like, I think that David Yerman's site is literally only a header that says men's versus women's. And then some websites are really long and they're very expansive and they have a lot of different options. So I think that, uh, you know, you want to play around or just talk to your website provider, whoever it might be, and discuss, you know, what your real goals are with your website and then making sure that they're at least semi-prominent in the uh, in your homepage. The David Yerman site's actually, it's pretty in depth now. So we do have the header image. Yeah, we have the header image focused on women's and we have stuff for men. It's pretty in depth. So again, take a look at that as an example, but I think yeah. there's a good mix there of, it doesn't have to be so long where it's a continuous scroll, but really think through 
What are the goals? How do we even reiterate them a few times throughout the page and really sell someone on the idea of the brand overall? That goes a long way. Definitely. But everybody, don't go away. We're going to be back in just 30 seconds with this quick advertisement. Shopping for jewelry can be expensive and buying the perfect piece on a monthly budget can be a big ask. And that's why we're excited to introduce this episode sponsor, Sezzle. Sezzle is an alternative payment option that allows shoppers to buy now and pay later by splitting their purchase into four interest-free installments. Merchants are paid upfront in full and orders can ship right away. Adding Sezzle as a checkout option is proven to increase sales, conversions, basket sizes, and purchase frequency for merchants. Consumers love the flexibility and pay no interest or added fees. And they integrate seamlessly with punch rock websites, which is pretty cool. If you'd like to join over 16,000 merchants taking advantage of the benefits Sezzle has to offer, and exclusively for In The Loop listeners, go to get.sezzle.com slash loop, that's L-O-U-P-E, and enjoy your first month free as an exclusive In The Loop offer. Thanks, and back to the show. Hi, everybody. So let's get back into this. Let's wrap uh, kind of into the back half of this thing. We're going to get into some actionable items when it comes to your website or just taking your web presence really seriously. Um, I feel like everybody thinks that they're taking it seriously, which is a good thing. But maybe we can talk about what they can focus on. So let's talk about some best practices. Do you have anything for us, Cody? I do. I will say, just going back to Sezzle for a second, Yeah, I love the feature where it breaks it down and shows you in four easy installments of oh, just a small number. It's very dangerous. It's easy to just see that number, but like, oh, I can afford that. Click, click. You just, sometimes you put it on the grid and it's like, oh, as, as low as 10 bucks a month. And I'm like, wow, that's really low. <laughs> like 10 bucks a month. I find that in my cushions or whatever. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we've seen our retailers install that and start getting sales that way. And it's it's been great. So yeah, I mean, in terms of best practices, one of the biggest things we say is when we talk to a client for the first time, or we start to see photos of in-store and all these great things they're doing in-store to make the experience so much better. It's like, okay, from your website, I didn't get that at all. Your brand yeah. colors in your store are much different than what it is on your website. So at its foundation, it's really important that from a branding perspective, that you do have some similarities there because people are finding you on your website to begin with and they're wanting to see what that looks like. And if they come into the store and it's a different experience altogether, it can kind of throw them off. So I'd say number one practice is make sure there's some visual continuity there from your website to your actual store location if you have one. Yeah, as above, so below. You know, make sure that uh, your website and your store they should feel like extensions of each other. So you know, I don't think that that's one of those things that you should overlook. You know, if you're fun, everyone wants to be. You know, they're fun and they're part of the community and they have really cool people at their store. That should be represented on your website. You guys can be fun and cool and part of the community on your on your website, but just show that. There's a couple different ways, whether that's showing you or your guys involvement in community activities or showing your guys as having events or whatever it is, make sure you're doing that. that. We see that so much with, it comes to play with content where we have retailers that have said, people just think that we're too upscale, that we're too luxury, that we're not approachable. And that's not us at all. But on the side, it feels very high end and very luxurious. So yeah. that's what we always go for, incorporating more lifestyle photos and making it seem more attainable. Those are easy ways to just switch out the visuals of your site to make it seem more friendly. So they have that thought whenever they come into your store as well. Like, oh, this brand's friendly. They're approachable. I'm ready to go there. It doesn't seem like it's too expensive for me or I feel intimidated to go into the store. Other things we can talk about. I mean, when you're talking about content is what kind of content you're putting up and making sure that that you want to upload really high res images, but you don't want to upload the biggest files that you have because page load speed is so important as well. So Just doing an analysis either on your own or looking into your analytics data to see, okay, what's the average time it takes for my page or my website to load? If that's too long past a couple seconds, more often than not, people are just going to click out automatically. I mean, we're in a day and age where we want things fast. We want it quick. And if I click on a website and it's not two to three seconds and it's loaded up, I just swipe out and I go to the next website for what I'm looking for. So doesn't cost any money to navigate to the website. So it's like, why should I sit here on this on this crappy website? So maybe we can think about a lot of people are really confused when it comes to uh, their what makes a site load slow. What it could be is, for example, if a if an image is being served, you know, that's a fancy way of saying is being brought to the viewer at 500 by 500 uh, pixels, then the image that's being loaded should be as close as possible to 500 by 500 pixels. If you put up an image that's, for example, 
3000 by 3000 pixels the what the computer in the website has to do is take that image and shrink it all the way down to 500 by 500 which is it just another added load to the website? So one one image might not make a huge impact, but what we're seeing sometimes is these people, they go out and they have a beautiful photo shoot with these brides and grooms, and they want to use it all over their website. And that's great. But when you put up like, you know, sometimes those photos come out of the camera, you know, 5,000, 7,000 uh, pixels wide and putting them into a, a slot that might be only 700 pixels wide, it really will slow down your image and as a result, increase your bounce rate uh, for customers. Yeah, I think it's just easy to get all these photos back from a photographer that are resized for print where you need for a print. lot more pixels for all that. And like, oh, I'll just drag it onto my website, not realizing you're just adding more data to the site that it has to process and to load. That's why, you know, you really want to avoid sometimes, you know, GIFs and things auto-populating. Oh, we have these nice fancy ways these things are coming in and going out because each of that adds another layer of complexity. And what I hate most is when I go to a website, the top part loads or one piece loads and the other one hasn't loaded yet. Then it just looks incomplete. So at that point, you need the whole thing to load at one time or not to load at all because that mismatch there is going to cause some frustration. Cody, tell me you don't say GIF. You don't, you don't actually, you say GIF. You got to say GIF. My last name is Giles. It starts with a G. Oh. It's the same situation. Jeff, Giles. Get, like, I don't say you Giles. You think you know someone. You think you know someone, and then you find out they say Jeff. Goodness. This is the last episode together. <laughs> oh, man. Never, never coming back on this one. Um, what else you got as far as um, best practices for these people? Yeah. Again, it goes back to, you know, thinking about the consumer perspective when we talk about, you know, verbiage and we talk about flow. So if I'm building a website, I really have to put on the hat of the consumer and think, what are they coming here for? What am I intending to show them? What does that journey need to look like? I think we'll talk in the next portion about analytics, but there's ways even on the backing with Google Analytics of how I can look and see what the most popular journey is for someone coming into the website. So I know they come to the homepage. From there, they click on X button to go to another page, then go to another page. As I start to think about that flow, I need to understand the content that I'm serving them to make sure that it's relevant to what they're needing and I'm meeting their needs for that. So that then sometimes goes into category pages. So how do I want to break down and serve them the content? You know, if it's rings, instead of them clicking rings and just seeing everything, do I then want to show them a page before that about styles or about pricing, X, Y, and Z, just thinking through what's the most logical flow. And you know, a lot of that is mirrored by what's happening in store. So it's even thinking through, okay, how does my consumer think whenever they're in store or my customer think when they're in store? How do I maybe map that back to what's happening online as well? Because they're probably gonna have the same questions even more at some points. I think that uh, we use this term flow and I I, I don't want to get into too techie of a term. But for example, think about when you're buying something that's not jewelry or something that's not something on your website and think about, for example, going to Nike. You're going to Nike and you're buying a pair of sneakers. What are every single step on your website that they have to interact with or not even on your website that are related to that brand that leads to you buying that specific pair of shoes? You know, you might see a... Uh, you might go to their website, click around a little bit, see something, get retargeted in an ad. They, you click on the ad, look at a couple more shoes, close it out, come back a couple weeks later, you add it to your... Uh, shopping bag, you proceed through, you buy it, and then it gets served to you. That whole step from piece to piece is all very calculated and thought about to get you to buy a pair of Nikes and not a pair of, you know, Reebok slides or whatever you're going to do. So just another thing to think about uh, when it comes to your, your online experience. Yeah, absolutely. I think the other piece too is just kind of keeping going with that storytelling aspect. And what we talked about is that, I mean, the product is the product. If I'm a retail location and I know I have three competitors in the area, we're all selling the same product. What is my advantage or what leg up do I have for that? So then it goes into details about putting the history on your website, talking about your store, talking about your team, um, those other selling points that are going to get someone to buy into you because of the brand, not just because of the product, which can be tricky at times. You know, we've had several retailers that we've talked to that they're not always comfortable putting their team front center for the camera on the website just for fears of what could happen. You definitely have to approach that with caution. And each store is different and we respect the decisions there, but we definitely see a rise in engagement when someone can resonate with somebody in store through social, through online, et cetera. It's just getting that familiar face. So when I walk into the store, oh, I know that's Sarah, a sales associate. I've seen her on social a lot. I'm gravitating towards her for a product and doesn't feel so standoffish. And it breaks on that barrier, essentially. And not everybody is, is like you and me who has a deal with jewelry all the time. You know, some, maybe you're like, 
like my older brother. He just just had to buy an engagement ring. He's engaged now. But that experience is very... Um, it's something we've had to have said to us all the time for all these years that the engagement ring is this big, important experience. But just think about it from the experience of a you know 29-year-old guy who has to buy this thing that's kind of expensive that he knows nothing about. It's intimidating. So think about it from their shoes. How would you go about it if you have to buy this thing? It's going to be uh, something we want to explore in the next season of In the Loop is like, how can, you know, what is buying an engagement ring like in 2020 or 2021? And, uh, you know, maybe then you'll kind of be able to understand from their perspective as well. Yeah, definitely. So let's get into also kind of measuring if they need help, because sometimes, you know, maybe your site is... Uh, doing really well already, or maybe it needs some help. What are some things that they can look at to see if their site is doing well versus not well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we look at Google Analytics a lot for that data. So for those of you that don't know, Google Analytics is essentially a data platform where you take a piece of code from Google, you drop it into your website, into the header, into the code. And from there, it's able to give you all kinds of information back about your website, what users are doing, what type of users are coming to the site, all of this data that you can harness to your fingertips to understand, is my site working like it should? Are customers finding what they need? Where can I improve and what can I do? When we look at analytics, I'm going to just fire off a few metrics that we look at that are really important whenever we think about site health and just some initial things we're looking at. The top one's bounce rate. So bounce rate is essentially the percentage of profiles or percentage of users that come to your website, they don't engage with anything, and they simply just leave your site. So I've come into the homepage, maybe I've looked at one or two things, I've just scrolled up and down, I haven't clicked on anything, I haven't engaged, and I'll leave. That's counted as a bounce rate. You obviously, they want your bounce rate to be lower, so that can give us a good indication. Mike, you can tell me, I feel like for us, yeah. 30 to 50, 55% is around average for what I, we see. I'm hoping I, I try to get them below 50, but you know, if if you have a couple of things that are you are know, you're running a lot of ads, it can sometimes boost up your bounce rate, and that's okay. But things things like adding a pop up, just so you know, in in you know 2020, people hate pop ups. Uh, it, they can be useful tools because like if you're offering a coupon code or if you're offering a value, but having a a, a pop up that says like you know like something really annoying that they have to immediately close out of, a lot of people will, will just leave the site entirely instead of go through that task of finding the closeout button. I appreciate a pop-up that's timed. So don't send it yes. to me whenever I'm just on the site. I haven't even really learned about the brand or I haven't found what I'm looking for. Let me engage one to two times or review one to two pages or spend about 30 seconds on site. Then show me a pop-up. I want a promo code. I'll give you my email address there. But immediately once I hit the site, it can really water down the user experience from that standpoint. I like when it displays uh, as I'm hovering off the screen or to the above bar um, or into tabs. Uh, you can also add, I think, a custom piece of Java that makes it so that when they hover off of the screen, then it can display. And you'll see some pretty big sites do that as well. Some sites to have the exit pop up. So if I'm trying to close out of the tab, are you sure you want to leave? Are you sure? Like yeah. Promo code. It's like okay, maybe I'm I'm interested. Maybe. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's a big one. Another thing we look at is page load speed, which we kind of already talked about. What's important there? You want it to load fast, and then kind of session duration. So when someone comes to your website, how long are they spending on the site? We, you know, we see for this in the jewelry industry specifically around two to four minutes. Mike, you can correct yeah. me there too, but. Yep. Um, that's overall viewing, you know, around three to four pages. So we don't want someone to come spend 15 seconds viewing one page and they're out. We just know they haven't found what they needed yet. So we look at how many pages they're viewing and how long they're staying on the site. That way, when we do that, we set up goals. So those goals we can set up and say, okay, we want to look for goals where people spend four minutes on the site or they view three to four pages. That then helps us start setting benchmarks and tracking things. And it's really important to start mapping that back from you know, your organic traffic. So now people that find me organically are always going to spend the most time on site because they're seeking me out. I look back and know, okay, for my organic traffic, they're spending four minutes on site, viewing four pages, the bounce rate's 30%. Those metrics are good. Now I can start comparing that to my other forms of traffic. So my paid Google campaign, if I'm running that, matching that traffic back up. Facebook ads, Instagram ads, understanding those benchmarks allows you to compare and contrast what's happening for each source of traffic to know where you need to funnel budget, where you need to funnel dollars and attention to make sure you're getting the most out of your website. 
Yeah, because you, the worst thing you can do, of course, is just just shout into the abyss and and have no one be listening. So you know, pay, paying for you know Facebook ads and and them not be doing anything, you might as well be spending that money on something that might be impacting it, which might be you know for SEO or SEM. Um, things like that. So I I think that those metrics are really interesting. You can get lost in the metrics if you're not careful where you're just staring at them all the time and not actually taking any action. So that kind of leads us into what is our last topic, which is how can you... What, what is the one actionable item that you would give these people that are listening to start improving their website's conversions? I think it would be first to look at your data and understand it. And like you just mentioned, with analytics, you can get very overwhelmed with what you're seeing. Just taking it one step at a time and committing to learning just one or two different metrics and what they mean and building your knowledge over time so you really know on the back end what's happening on your website. So you can make these actionable changes and put yourself in the best position to win. Yeah. So, and and mine, my one piece of advice is if you're ever sitting around trying to find what is the next thing I should be doing with my website, you know, I've already got one built and it's on a, a decent platform and I already have all my inventory up. I think that you can never have enough category pages. So category pages, these are pages that, for example, if you have earrings, well, if someone hits earrings on your navigation, your first instinct might be to direct them to all shop all earrings. And again, that gets into that situation where you're presenting them with 5,000 earring products. But the truth is, they're not going to look at 5,000 earrings. They're going to look at maybe the first page, maybe the second page. But what that allows you to do is if they're looking in their mind for a hoop earring as opposed to a stud, they don't have to go through all those pages to find the, the, the hoop earrings. What you can do with a category page is break down all of the earrings into category types. So for example, at the top, you'd have your hoop earrings. And then below that, you might have studs and di- or diamond studs or gemstone studs. And then you could have chandelier earrings or you could have um, you know, danglies or whatever they're called. So you can have all those different options and it allows them to look at the category visually and say, you know, I do actually want a hoop. I, I, that's, and they didn't even know it. And then when they're served with, with products, it's only 15 uh, hoops. And then that's a much more manageable one. And then at the very least, even if they get to the end of all 15 of those and they see, you know, none of those really caught my fancy, well, they can go back and then they can start looking at uh, studs or, or chandeliers or whatever it's going to be. Yeah, so much more you can do there even from an ad perspective once you have those category pages and getting people exactly to what they're looking for on the site. That's right. So everybody, uh, that's where we're going to kind of end it. This was, I think, very interesting to hear kind of your perspective on this. And it's something I'm very passionate about. Of course, the user experience is kind of at the, at the heart of what we all do. And we don't even... Some people don't even know that's what they're catering to, which is UX. But a very special thank you to Cody for coming on. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for doing it. Yeah. And you guys can find more information about our sponsors and about In The Loop um, online. And you can get in touch with us online as well. Uh, Thanks, everybody. And we'll end it right there. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of In The Loop. My name is Michael Burpo, and we'll be back again for the next live show on October 8th. And the next show will be on Spotify and Apple Podcasts on October 15th. And that'll be covering SEO, the strategy to drive more people to your website. And that'll be with guests Brian Cockrum from Punchmark and Blake Smith from The Smithy Group. Special thanks to Sezzle for sponsoring this show. And you can learn more about them by going to get.sezzle.com slash loop and enjoy your first month free at an exclusive in the loop offer. And special thank you to ClearSale for sponsoring this week's episode. And you can learn more about them by going to offer.clear.sale slash loop. Again, that's L-O-U-P-E and start preventing fraud and chargebacks on your website today. And you can find out more about Punchmark and the Smithy Group by going online to punchmark.com or to thesmithygroup.com and learn more. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Bye.